Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm doing a private call, and I want to lay some basic common sense strategies out when dealing with, with the courts, the administrative, and a lot of this, if you stop and think, basically your whole life is based on what we're going to be talking about here today. And you may not have thought of it that way, or you may not think on these terms. But we're going to go through some some topics here. And I'm going to lay out some other issues that, as American people, we were not aware of, gave any consideration to, was unbeknown to us. But through recent discoveries on different case laws, as far back as 1866, 1865, Civil War, up to as, as 1921, and if you stop and look at what we're talking about, it's still continuing today. The state of emergency that they keep using on us this puts us into a very, very predicament area of how the courts are running. Because the courts are not disclosing the fact that they are running us under a state of emergency, that they're bringing us into a state of war court where we are considered enemies of the state. But to sit back and say that, go back and sit here and explain that that is that is in congressional legislation it goes back into the banking act of 1933 where they have declared where they have sat down and promoted the american people as enemies of the state unbeknown to us the fact that they took the gold and silver off of us and forced us into a foreign currency which has no financial background, no documentation, and other than it is a credit line. And that's where the problem's coming in. There are so many things that has been passed through administrative executive orders, has been done by the administrative agencies itself, has been done even through legislation behind closed doors. And we are not privy to it, but they're out of this is, well, it was put somewhere in some book, some place. And because it was written and it was placed somewhere, and if you didn't find it, that's not our fault, but it was disclosed. That's the mentality that they're running. That's the problem that we're having. That's the issue that we're running up against. And this is stuff that people aren't aware of and didn't know. Why would we think this? Why would we even consider this? But I'm going to walk you through some things, and I want to show you some, some points, and you're going to go, oh, wow, my God, how did they get away with this? Because we were kept asleep. All these dealings were done behind closed doors. All these dealings were done in the back rooms. That's where the problem's coming in. Now, I'm going to walk you through some basic strategy for the court system. And this is some stuff that I've been taught and I've come up with throughout the years. And if you really sit back and understand, comprehend, and associate, comprehend, and associate. Once you comprehend what's being said, 
and you start associating what we're saying with what we're dealing with, it changes the whole outlook of what you're dealing and who you're dealing with. Because what I'm trying to do is we're not giving legal advice. We're trying to level the playing field. We're trying to give us an advantage. Even if it is a draw, that's a win. It's better than a total loss on our side because we didn't know. A draw is a win. I'm trying for enforcement. I'm trying to sit down and get the wins on our side of the fence. A solid win. But you got to know what you're up against. And you got to know how they're doing it. That's why a lot of the stuff I do, I get into history. History plays a big part of this. It discusses what they've done to us and how they've done it to us. So let me get started here. I'm going to do a share screen. All right. The foundation, the title goes into Common Sense Strategy in Fighting the Government Administrations and Courts. The foundation. What are some of the foundations that we need to understand? And this, these few items here, what we're going to be talking about, applies to just about every day in life. Whether you're working a job, whether you are at home growing up, whether you, you're the parent, the first few of these things is everyday common sense. Everyday understanding. Then we're going to get down into some things that ties into a little more on their side of the fence. That goes on this side of the fence because remember, when we're dealing with the government, there is only two positions. There's only two classes of people. There is no third, only two employee and employer. Who is paying whose salary? And that's what it comes down to. If you are the employer, you're paying, paying the employee's salary. If we are the American people, we are compensating the government offices. We are paying their salary. They are our employees. Simple terminology. This isn't about female. This isn't about male. This isn't about gender. This is about the people and the servant, management and labor, employer, employee. It's that simple. Keep it on those terms. And that changes the whole outlook. First thing we need to know, need to know the rules. What's the rules? All right, you work for a company. You got to know the rules of that company. What's their policies? What's their regulations? Same thing with working with the system. What's their rules? Because everything that was in the statutes at large, everything that's in the United States Code is guidelines for them. Their rules are court, is how they are to operate. The criminal rules procedures are how they are to operate. The rules of evidence is how they are to operate. The judicial rules of canon is how they're supposed to conduct themselves. The professional rules of ethics is how they are to conduct themselves. Everything that's created by them is how they are to conduct themselves when dealing with us or dealing with each other. 
It's their regulations, it's their policies, their protocol, their procedures. It wasn't designed to be used against John Q. Public. That's the same thing with the manufacturer. Those rules, or whatever company you apply to, only apply to internal employees. It does not extend out past the gate to the general public. It's only for internal. And once you get this mindset and you understand this, this makes everything a whole lot easier to understand of what you're dealing with. A lot easier. So know the rules. What's the rules? What's the regulations? What, how, how are they supposed to function? Like I said, the statutes are the rules. Rules of evidence. Civil rules procedure. Criminal rules. Canon rules. Rules of ethics. Local rules. Court bench rules. All that stuff is their guidelines, their rules, how they are to operate. Know their job description. What is their description for their job? Are they a judge? Are they a clerk of court? Are they an attorney? Are they a public defender? Are they a prosecutor? Are they a court administrator? What's your job duty? What's your job description? What's your job function? That goes back to ignoring the rules on how that job is supposed to operate, how they're supposed to perform that job. Know their language. Their language is written in their rules. Their language is written in their statutes. Their language is written in their codes. The language is written in their manuals, their books, how they are to interpret words, how they are to use and function and define their self under their language. Number four, know what Congress says the law is, not how the court wants to misconstrue it. Congress created the first three positions. Congress created the rules. Congress created their job. And Congress created their language. The court system cannot come in and redirect, re-legislate terminology, not their job. This is like going back in, dealing with the lawyers. You ask them for their license. Well, the court gave me consent. The court gave me the, the, the ability to have a license. Show me where it's written in the Constitution. That the court is a legislative body, and that the court legislates and creates laws and creates agencies and creates private associations. They don't. This goes back into a problem. This is what, I, what we're sitting here saying. That's why you have to know their rules, know their job, know their language. The court system has no authority to create the bar association and only create only these people are allowed to come before us. We only, is that legislative? Show me a legislative law. Again, this is part of the problem here. They're, they are misconstruing and abusing their position. They are overextending their abilities to be able to do what they're doing because our ignorance, because we're always told, well, you got to go hire one of us. You got to go hire one of us. If you don't hire one of us, you can't come into our courts. Well, if I, if I have to hire one of yours to come into your courts, then obviously you can't drag my ass into the courtroom. Think about it. Common sense. If I have to hire one of yours, then it's obviously that you can't bribe me in. Because if I have to hire one of yours, what am I giving up? And that's the question. What are you giving up? 
by hiring one of theirs. And that's going to come later on down here of what we're talking about and what you have not been told. Okay, let's go back under five. Understanding their job obligation and performing that office. What's their duty? What's their job description? Again, it goes back in, know their job. What's their job description? What's their duty? How are they supposed to perform in that duty? What's their what's their restrictions? What's their regulations? How are they supposed to function? When you're working on an assembly line in a business, that's your job duty. It isn't to go up and run the office. It isn't to go out and check mail. It isn't to go out and do all these other things unless that is in your job title. Unless that is in your job description. If you are a line worker, then that's your job. It is up to you to go do something else in that factory. Your job description is line worker, not management, not foreman, not janitor. It's whatever your job description is. Now, the next thing comes in is, did you breach? Did you go out and do something that you wasn't supposed to do? It goes back to show a breach, abuse, or negligence and their performance under that job title. That's number six. If you were out doing something other than what you were hired for, that's negligence. That's misuse of that position. You failed to perform of what you were required to do. That's the same thing with them. What's their job duty when they fail to uphold that job duty when they fail to perform according to their own rules, their own job description, according to their language. They fail to perform. That's negligence. That's an injury. That's an, that is an injury that you can show how you were damaged because they failed to comply. This is like being a mechanic. If I fail to tight the tires down tight enough and that tire comes off, that's negligence on my side. If you get injured, you get hurt because of my negligence, you got a claim against me. That's the same thing here. When these judges, these lawyers, these government officials fail to perform in compliance with their job duty under the Constitution, under their regulations, under their rules, this is negligence. And if the American people get harmed, we now have a damage for claim because these people were under a paid contract. A contract to perform on behalf of us, the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the states clearly go in and define what they, the government, what they are to do on protecting us. It isn't up to us to have the knowledge. It's up to them to automatically protect us. It's up to them to automatically do their job correctly. And when they don't, and we get damaged, now we have to go back and show the type of injury they caused against us. What harm did we get? What injury did we get? What damage did we sustain because of their willful negligence? Ladies and gentlemen, these first eight is the very foundation 
of how the system is supposed to work and how we should be operating. This applies to everyday life, working with a factory. This is why OSHA comes into factories. Did the, did the company meet OSHA standards? Was there a safe environment? If you sustain a workman's comp claim because of negligence, because the company did not perform the duty to keep a safe environment, that's negligent. That's injury to you. That's damage to you. The court system and the administration is absolutely no different. It's only different because you of your mindset. That's the only difference. It's your mindset. These first date, if you understand these first date, it's functional in everyday life. Even in marriage, it's functional in a marriage. Just have to think about it. But these first date is the very foundation of understanding, comprehend, and associate. Now we're going to get into the next step here, number nine. We have to know the difference between legislative enactment and that of administrative regulations, rules, protocol, and public policy. We are being charged majority under administrative regulations, not legislation, unbeknown to us, because we assume we Assume what they're saying is correct. We don't know their job duty. We don't know their regulations. We don't know how they're supposed to function and, and how they function, who it applies to. And I'm going to give you some, some simple examples here. Go back in and go back in and think here a little bit. Think. How many times? Has a law been passed on the books on election to put a stop sign out in front of your house or a stop sign on some four-way corner or a stoplight or a caution light? How many times has legislation came out and created a law to change the speed limit in a section of road and then change it back periodically? You're going to find out it's never been done. What you're going to find out is the administration has done it. An agency has done it, more than likely DOT, Department of Transportation. Or some other agencies that deals with the highway. They are the ones that put the stop sign there. They are the ones that put the stop light there. They are the ones that change the speed limit. Now, that's administration. That's not legislative. We're being tricked into believing that when they change things administratively, it's supposed to apply to the citizen. And this is where the deception comes in. They have done this on such a regular basis that we don't know the difference. We just go along with the program. We didn't sit back and say, wait a minute, Judge. Whoa, 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 time out, time. We need to go back and we need to look at who put that speed limit sign out on that section of the road. Was it a legislative law? Or was it an administrative practice, administrative policy, administrative protocol in order to entrap the people? 
Same thing with banking. Now think about what we're going to say here. Same thing with banking. When you sign your mortgage note, you sign that promissory note. You signed a contract. You signed an agreement. But as part of that agreement, you were not told. As part of that agreement, you were not aware of. Part of that agreement was never explained. When you're going into bankruptcy court, the first mistake that we make is that we make excuses on why we failed. And even though the government may have caused it due to a layoff, due to job shortage, due to state of emergencies, due to whatever, even though the government may have caused it, we go in and make excuses. And that's what they want you to do, make excuses. Because when you make excuses, then you take the blame. You take the fault. That's exactly what they want you to do. Let's do reverse psychology here. You ask the bank, do you have a document with my name on it? Right here it is, got a contract. So I did sign the paperwork. Yes, you did. Well, I'll tell you what, does your bank, when you sign these contracts, these mortgage notes, do they go through the Security Exchange Commission? The SEC? As part of the, the banking regulations? Your rules, your guidelines, another rules, another job description. Did you send this through the Security Exchange Commission? Yes or no? Well, that's irrelevant. No, it's not. Because the question now comes in, once it went through them, how many times did you sell it? And how much did you make off my signature? Because I don't see your name on here. I don't see you signing this contract. This contract was a one-way signature. We need to go back and pull the financial records off the Security Exchange Commission and see how many times you sold my signature and how much you got for it. And isn't it true you can't sell the property until it's paid for? And if you sold the note, the property had to be paid for in order to sell it to the next bank or to the next business? And if they sold it, that had to be paid for them for them to be able to sell it. See, these are things that we don't think of. These are things that's not being exposed and exposed to us. This goes back to how their administration works without our knowledge. This goes back to their legislative. Show me in any legislative law where you can sell my signature and make money off me. We don't ask these questions. We don't think on these terms. Something you need to think about. Which brings us down to when we're dealing with them, what are we being charged under? Are we being charged under an administration? Or are we being charged under a legislation? How are we being charged? How are they bringing us in? How are they dealing with us? See, we never ask these questions. We never make these points. And they don't want to address them because if they do, they're going to get caught. And if they're going to avoid it, then obviously, then, then you know that you're in the wrong setup. 
that this is a claim that can be brought against him for negligence and abuse and misuse of that position. This is just food for thought. This isn't legal advice. This is food for thought. This is stopping thinking here, thinking outside the box. Now, another thing, and I'm going to bring this up because we just recently discovered this. We've been arguing jurisdiction, but we've been arguing jurisdiction of these courts, I believe, in the wrong manner. And I know the majority of people are going to sit there and say, well, these were admiralty courts. No, they are not. Because for it to be an admiralty court, an admiralty flag has to fly in that courtroom. That admiralty flag, by legal definition, is a, is a flag with an anchor and a linger going through the anchor on a field of red. That is an admiralty flag. A maritime flag are those little flags that fly off for signaling. That's maritime. The gold French flag is Army regulations under 840-10. That's the military flag. It's got the military eagle and the state flag so the military spike for military district. And that's a very important point here that we're going to get to next. Because now it comes into what are we talking about for jurisdiction of this court? Through recent discoveries and going back into not case law, court cases. And I got them written down here for you to look at. A question comes into, are we in a court under a state of war? Now, that's a very important question. Are we in under a state of war? Are we being brought in as enemies of the state? Are we being brought in as an alien resident? Are we being brought in as a belligerent? Under some state of emergency, and remember, we've been under a state of emergency since 1933. Every two years they renew it. This goes back to 1865, though, with the Civil War on how they tried two American citizens, civilians, in a military tribunal. They were not given protected rights under the Constitution. They come under strict protocol and regulations under a military tribunal with no protected rights whatsoever. Their rights' rights were waived. You have none. And that's exactly what these courts are doing. When you go into a court, a judge asked you about waiving your rights. They force you to hire an attorney. Well, I don't want an attorney, so you're going to waive the attorney. Yes, so you're going to waive your rights. He's not talking about the rights to the attorney. He's talking about your right, protected rights. You're, so you're going to waive your rights. He tricks you through deception. and puts you right under a military tribunal, and you don't even realize it. This is how the courts are operating. Stop and think about what's being said here. Think back on some of these issues. But in these cases, that's down here, that's showing. It goes in and deals with them being in a military tribunal in 1865-1866. In 1921, we just came out of First World War. The civilian courts were running us under a state of emergency in 1921, and the people didn't realize it. And that's what I'm sitting here saying. There's so much that we don't realize. There's so much that's being hidden from us that they don't disclose that we're being tricked and manipulated into. So much. In these cases, ex parte, Mary Sharab, Nancy, Brown, Jones, every one of them, their protected rights were waived 
under a administrative tribunal, whether it's military or administrative by the civilian court system out here. They had their rights waived. And they were put under administrative protocol and administrative regulations and the military public procedures and public policy, not constitutional protected rights. Give this some, some deep consideration. Comprehend, associate. Comprehend and associate. Because one is an administrative tribunal where all rights waived and no protected rights. No protected rights. You have nothing. It's all waived. The other is where your rights are upheld under a constitutional oath and under their job duties and wages received for that position. In those cases, they went back and defined administrative tribunal under regulations or the people, these people were supposed to be brought into a, a constitutional court as American citizens, civilians. And if you are an American citizen, civilian, you're not an enemy of the state. I realize a lot of you don't want to use the word citizen, civilians. You want to use whatever. But the point in these laws, case laws, in these cases, because they were defined as American citizen, civilians, they were not considered enemies of the state or belligerents. Don't go be playing with words because you don't like certain words because it can put you in a position as a foreigner to have you expelled, which you get no place to go. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy. Sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot a whole lot worse than the court system could ever do it, and that is exactly what they want. That's exactly what they're looking for. You make their job so much easier. This has just recently come up in the last month or so. I've we come across this. I've had some people send me some information, but I come across this from research. And the two jurisdictions is wartime jurisdiction and constitutional jurisdiction. That court needs to be challenged. Are you bringing me in under wartime state of emergency? You're bringing me in under the bankruptcy? You're bringing me in under the alien property custodian? Or am I being brought in here as an American citizen with protected rights? Which one is it? Something to think about. This is that 13th, what we're talking about. The other is where your rights are upheld under the Constitution, under their constitutional oath, and under their job duties and wages received for that position. And that's our argument. You're being paid, you're receiving wages. You have a job to protect my rights. It ain't up to me to know all my rights. It's your job to automatically protect them. And if you don't, you've committed treason. You breached your job duty. You breached your commission. You were negligent in your job. It goes right back up to what we talked about on the first date. Negligence. You were harmed because of their negligence. 14, the question also becomes, what has the American people not been told? And how does these private backdoor administrative and congressional dealings affect the people in everyday living? And why has this not been openly disclosed in courts 
or by the administration when the people are charged. Why is not the Banking Act being brought up that there's no money? Why is not the Emergency Banking Act brought up that clearly shows that they defined you as an enemy of the state? And they took away your citizenship. Why aren't we being told that? Starting with the Enemy Act, this goes back into that Banking Act. And what they set up in this is why they're using it in the Banking Act. They stripped us without us knowing it. And they're not disclosing it. In which case, they have a duty to perform to protect us. And they're not doing it. The other thing they're not telling you is the Senate Docket 43, contract payable in gold, 1933 legislation, unbeknown to the people. You were not told in 1933 when they created this that all property, not some, not a few, the entire property system was turned over to government. You own nothing. It's all an obligation of the United States. All of it. That's where this Title 18 8 comes in. Because they took full responsibility for everything. The government is now obligated to go back and pay everything for us. But we've never been told that. We've never been informed of that. That's been withheld. That goes into these backdoor dealings. This goes back into these backdoor legislation and administrative regulations that they have passed unbeknown to you and I. Same thing with this executive order. Alien property custodian. It was in full force and effect. Then they transferred, the key word is transferred, from what was the Office of Alien Property Custodian, transferred or delegated to the Attorney General. They never got rid of it. They just moved it. That alien property custodian went part of trading with the Enemy Act. That was also part of the Banking Emergency Act. That's why we don't own anything. The government owns it. The government's responsible for everything under these laws that they're not disclosing. That's why you can't be brought into a bankruptcy court. Because if you're going to be brought into the bankruptcy court, the bank has to answer why they didn't discharge it. Why they didn't pay it off. Oh my God, yeah, comprehend, associate. This is what we're not being told. The problem of it is, you know, I don't have to make this stuff up. I'm sitting here showing you where it is at to back up exactly what I'm saying. And that's where the difference comes between what I teach and what you're being told by others. Under 1940, 1994, goes in and addresses it. Still alive and well today, but you're not being told. There's no reason for you to lose property. There's no reason for things to go into foreclosure. There's no reason for debt collectors. Zero, not a, absolutely no reason. If these people were doing the job that they were required to do under their job description, we wouldn't have all this shit. It's all these backdoor dealings. It's all this lack of knowledge. Oh, got to hire a go, go hire attorney. Go hire attorney. Got to hire one of ours. It's too complicated for you. These attorneys aren't doing their job. They're not doing the regulations. Excuse me. They're doing their job. They're railroading you. 
they are getting into your account and taking money out of your account for embezzling. This lack of knowledge is our problem. That's what this show is about. That's why we're doing this. Is to hopefully clear up some things for you. Number 15, these and more are withheld from the American people when dealing with the court system and administration. So the question becomes a matter of jurisdiction, state of war upon the people or constitutional protected rights. If we're under a state of war, we have no rights and everything is owned by the system and the system is required to sit down and handle everything through the wartime efforts through the alien property custodian. Discharge all of our debts, see that we get food on the table, see that all of our bills are paid, see that everything's taken care of. That's your job description under a state of war. But if you're gonna bring me in, you have to sit back and show and just expose that I'm an enemy of the state. You have to show that I am creating a war against you. And that's what these that's what these case laws up here got into. These were non belligerents. These people were doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to change your whole line of thinking of what we've been taught. This is a brief synopsis of what we're looking at. This is not legal advice. This is trying to give you knowledge that you didn't have and where it's sitting at and how to look at different points of view on this. You have every right to know this. You have every right to be aware of this and to stand your ground and demand. Because like I said in the beginning of this, there's only two positions in this country, management and labor, employer and employee. Who is paying whose salary? Who is being paid to take a position? And who's paying for that position? This is a labor management dispute. We're management. And it's about time we start stepping up to the plate and we start taking back what's ours. And we st start standing up and saying, no, no more. Because what they are doing, they are deliberately, intentionally, it's a violation of federal law for them to incite a riot among the American people holding that job position to where they would create such hostilities that it would upset the American people to take arms and create a riot. They are in violation of inciting a riot. Think about what we're sitting here saying. Let me bring it up here a minute. It is a felony under federal law to intentionally solicit, command, induce, or otherwise endeavor or to pursue another person to engage in a criminal act or criminal violence against a person or property, 18 U.S.C. 373. Many states have similar laws.
Whoever travels in interstate or foreign commerce or use any facility of an interstate or foreign commerce, in, including but not limited to, to the mail, telegraph, telephone, radio, or television, with intent to incite a riot or to organize, promote, encourage, participate in, or carry out on a riot, or to commit any act of violence as further furtherance of a riot, or to aid any or obey it aid and abet any person in inciting or participating or carrying carrying on a riot or committing any act of violence in, in furtherance of a riot. It goes right down through here. Here's the laws. And that's exactly what the court system is doing. That's exactly what our government is doing with Biden and the legislation. They are creating and then trying to incite the people to riot. That is a criminal act on their side of this fence. Let's go back in and look up what I was looking up before. Whoever is in sight sits on foot, assist, or engage in any rebellion or insurrection against the authority of the United States or the laws thereof, or give aid or comfort thereto, shall be fined under this title and imprisoned not more than 10 years. Again, this goes back to them. Let me show you something that you people may not be aware of. Article 1, Section 8. To provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrection, and repel invasion. The American people, as a militia, have the duty. We have the right to alter, reform, or abolish. It's in our Constitution. It's in our Declaration of Independence. When the government becomes tyrannical, it's up to the people to put the insurrection down. It's constitutional. Ladies and gentlemen, This was for education. This was for knowledge. This is something that needs to be spread hard and far. It needs to be put out. People need to understand. You need to write letters and file protest under the First Amendment, petition for redress, And address the, the insurrection and the willful inciting of riots and inciting harm to the American people by those who hold public office. You go to the military because Title 18, Section 4 says report, report it to the military. You report to whatever congressman you think that you are that has our best interests at heart. You follow it into the military, into, into the JAG, Army, Navy JAG. You follow it into the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You follow it into DOD. You follow it into the Provost Marshals. Ladies and gentlemen, your voice has to be heard. What I've ran you through is just a small tip of the iceberg. But it's something for you to think about. And it's something for you to consider. All I'm trying to do is level the playing field. I don't give regular advice. I show you 
where the information is at and with some of the information that is hid from us and withheld from us that you should know. I want to thank you for being and listening to the broadcast. And I would spread this as far and wide as you could. Talk to you later. Thank you.